Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. Hope you all are doing well. Today we're going to see how you can implement an autocomplete feature in your search functionality. The example I have over here is a Google search box. As you type in that search box, Google gives you five to 10 suggestions every time you add a new letter. So what we're going to design is going to be very similar to that. A few high level features you want to keep in mind as we go along. The first one is that the suggestions are going to be in real time. As the user is typing, every time they input a new letter, we want to update the suggestion. For every prefix, we want to return up to 10 suggestions to the user. When we return the suggestions to the user, we want to rank them based on the frequency. Given we want it to be real time, we want to make sure that the list of suggestions are getting updated within 100 milliseconds. If we go above that, there is a chance that as the user is typing, there is going to be some lag, which is not good for user experience at all. Finally, the search functionality we're going to look at is going to be not like a real time one that you have on Twitter. It's going to be more similar to a search engine where the, the suggestions doesn't change very frequently. All right, so the first thing we're going to take a look at is the API endpoint that you need. The only one we're going to be needing in this case is a get endpoint, maybe call it suggestions, which takes in a query string, which is going to be the prefix. So let's run through an example to show you how it's going to work. Let's say that the user wants to type dog. To type the full word, the user will have to type D first, and then an O, and then a G. In the process of going from writing only D to the whole word dog, the client is gonna be making three requests to the backend. One with the query string D, and then DO, and then DOG. Every single time the request hits our backend, the response is going to be the suggested query string based on that prefix. So when the user types D, there's going to be a set of 10, result, uh, 10 results that we sent to the user from the backend. When the user types DO, they're going to get a different set of results. And finally, when they type DOG, we're going to update the list of 10 yet again. So yeah, for every request, 10 suggestions are being returned as the user is typing. Let's start with a naive solution first, and then we're gonna look at the more optimal one. If you think about a naive solution, we can have a relational table with the frequency of every search string. I have an example of the table over here. You can see we have two columns, query string and frequency. Query string is the string that the user searched for, and frequency is the number of times the string has been searched in the past. I have some example data that you can look at. The query string burger has been searched for 1500 times, cheese for 700 times, check for 600, and Burlington for 300. So you can see that uh, the query string column is the string that the users are searching for, and frequency is the number of times that string was searched for. So to get suggestions, as we talked about, we want like for a given prefix, we want the top 10 most searched, uh, most searched suggestion. So we can use a very simple SQL query if we have a table like this. All we're doing is a select star from search history, which is the table you see here. And then you have a where clause that does where query string like, and then you have the prefix and then the uh, percentage sign. What this means is when the user typed uh, D, it's gonna be, uh, the query is gonna take the form of this. When the user typed DO, the query string is gonna be in the form of this. And finally, when the user typed dog, it's gonna be this, all right? So you get an idea of how the SQL query is going to change as the user is typing in the, uh, in the client. As I mentioned before, if the user is typing dog, this is going to mean three separate API calls. 
hence three separate SQL queries. So this is going to work fine for very, very small data sets and when the traffic is very low. That's because for very small data sets, doing a query like this shouldn't take too long, even though we're doing some kind of a regular expression match. Also, if the traffic is very low, that means your, uh, your MySQL or Postgres, whatever relational database you have, should be able to handle it. The problem will happen when you have lots of requests coming at the same time, because as you saw, for every new user, as they're typing, the number of requests can increase very, very quickly. So yeah, for a small data set and low volume traffic, this solution should work just fine, but it won't scale as you have more and more users. E even when you cross like a certain threshold, like a very small threshold of users, you are gonna start running into a lot of problems. Now that we know that uh, the solution explained does not scale very well, let's see how we can optimize it and how can we actually come up with a solution that's going to work as your application is scaling. All right, so before looking at the solution, we are going to talk about the try data structure. This is one of the most common data structure that you should know about when you are designing any kind of autocomplete functionality. So I'm going to explain the data structure a bit over here, but if you don't understand from my explanation, I would recommend pausing the video here and then learning about the data structure from other online resources. So try data structure is very similar to a basic tree that you learn about. Every node apart from the root node is a letter. So let's take an example, right? So I'm going to zoom in one level more. There you go. So you see B over here, that's the letter. And then the child of B is E and then you have A, and then you have R. And then if you read it from B, it's gonna be B, E, A, R, that's bear. Now, if you take another example, B, the child is I, and then the child is D. If you make the word, it's gonna be bid. So you can see all the leaf nodes in your data structures in this tree. Every leaf node is gonna be a word. And all the ancestor is gonna be the letters leading up to the word. So for bear, you can see R has an ancestor of A, A has an ancestor of E, and E has an ancestor of B. So if you join them, you get bear. So the starting, if, if the user types B, you can come here and then you just, you come to B and then you find all the, all the leaf nodes that you can reach from B. That would be bear and then you have bid it can also be B E uh, B E L L that's bell. And then you have B U L L that's bull. And then you have B U Y by. So for the prefix B, you can easily go and f find all the leaf nodes. This way you can easily find all the uh, query strings starting with the prefix B. Similarly, I'm going to move to this side over here. If your prefix is S, you can see we have cell, we have stock, and we have stop. If your prefix is SEL, then you have only one suggestion, which is going to be cell. If your prefix is STO, then your suggestion can be stop, and then STOCK, which is stock. So hopefully this gives you an idea of how the try structure can lay out your data in such a way that it's very easy to find all the suggestions for a given prefix. So we can generate this try structure from our existing data periodically. We're going to talk about how the generation happens, but for now just know that if we can generate a try structure like this, with all the data that we have, then for a given prefix, it should be pretty straightforward to find all the suggestions related to it. Uh, yep, so I already went through this, which is each node is gonna contain, uh, so each node is gonna contain the letter, right? One other change or one other add-on that you wanna have in this structure is that for every node, 
apart from the letter itself, you can add a list of all the suggestions leading from that node. So if your node is B, as we talked about, all the suggestions, if someone types the prefix B, is gonna be bear, bell, bit, bull, and by. So you can store all these within the node over here. What that lets you do is when the user types B, instead of actually computing all these, you can just look at an attribute of this node and that can give you all the answer. Of course, to add that data in, you would have to construct the whole try data structure first and then go node by node and actually compute it ahead of time. This is gonna be expensive, but what this means is when a query string is coming on from a user, you don't have to go and find all the leaf nodes. They have already been pre-computed for you and uh, it's been stored in the node itself. So at node E, let's see where's our node E. Let's look at this E over here. Uh, you can have, uh, where is it? Bear and bell. So in this node, which is E, so of course the prefix is BE, instead of going and finding bear and bell, you can just store them within this node, giving you very easy access when a user is actually typing. Similarly, at node STO, that's gonna be STO, so this node over here, you know that the leaf nodes leading from this node is stock and stop. So instead of computing this, you can go, instead of computing this when the user is typing, you can pre-compute this ahead of time so that your node over here, O, is gonna already contain stock and stop. All right, so hopefully that makes sense, both what the try data structure is and how you can make a slight modification by adding a new piece of data at every node, which is gonna let you pre-compute everything so that you don't have to find all the leaf nodes every single time the user's typing. Now, for a very small data set, you can just go ahead and store the try in memory. You don't have to store it in a persistent, uh, in a persistent database every single time. Once you compute it, you can just go ahead and store it in memory of your uh, API servers. But of course, that is gonna be for very, very small use cases and when your data set is very, very small. Realistically, you will have a larger application with lots more data. And of course, that would mean you need to store this try information somewhere in a database. When it comes to databases, one, what you can do is once you have computed the try data structure from your data set, you can go ahead and create a hash map from the try data structure and store that hash map in either a MongoDB database or a Cassandra database. So essentially any key value databases, you can go ahead and parse your try data structure and store the data as a hash map in those key value data stores. So essentially what you're doing is periodically you are generating this try data structure using your uh, existing search data. And then once you have the try data structure, you're reading the try data structure and then writing it to a Cassandra or MongoDB database. Along with storing the data in a database, you can also go ahead and cache the most common search strings in like a Redis or Memcached. What this means is for the most common search strings, instead of hitting the database at all, you can just serve them from your cache. Now we did a lot of talking about how the try data structure works, but how do we even get to the point of the try data, uh, data structure, right? Let's talk about that. So as I mentioned, this is not gonna be a very real-time suggestion generation. We're gonna do it more on a periodic basis, which is usually how most search engines work. So what you can do is have a nightly batch, which is gonna be a Spark job that reads your Apache logs. So Apache logs are gonna be all the, it's gonna contain all the HTTP requests hitting your server. So let's say if you're running it once a week, the Spark job can read the logs of that week. So it can go through and crunch through, it can go through and crunch through all the different logs of website visits or search strings 
that your user carried out throughout the week. It's going to parse all those, find all the different strings that the users are searching for, find their frequency, and then store them in some intermediate table. Once you have them in that intermediate table, you can go ahead and compute the try data structure that we talked about. Once you have the try data structure, you can go ahead and read or parse the try data structure to find all the different leaf nodes. And from that, you can go ahead and write your whole try in a Cassandra data store as key value pairing. So essentially what you're doing is you have a Spark job that, act that actually finds the search strings and with what frequency they're being searched for. From there, you can store it in like a temporary data database, like a MySQL table or whatever. From there, you generate this try that we talked about, something like this. Once you have this structure, you can go ahead and read it and then write it back to a Cassandra database so that you have everything there ready to be read from. All right, so now we talked about the bottom part you see here, which is the offline way of writing to Cassandra. Now let's talk about how you're actually gonna read from it. It's gonna be very, I'm gonna zoom in one level, two level, there you go. So it's gonna be very similar to what we talked at the beginning. Whenever a user goes to that search box and starts typing, for every single letter they type, you wanna send an API request to your suggestion endpoint with that query string. Let's say the user typed CA. You are making an API call to your backend with the query string CA. The backend is gonna to talk to the Cassandra table, so maybe it's gonna search your Cassandra table for a key CA, and then for that key, it's gonna get a list of all the suggestions sorted according to the frequency. Once the backend gets that, it can go ahead and send the request to the user. It's gonna be something similar to a list over here with like Canada, cat, and cancel. This is gonna make sure that given we have the data already in Cassandra and we can design the schema in such a way that the suggestions are going back to the user in under 100 milliseconds, which is gonna make sure that the user does not see any lag as they're typing. When it comes to offline generation, we already talked about it. We can run this pipeline maybe once every week or a few times every week, where we have the Spark job running, crunching through all the Apache logs, finding the search strings that get visited or that get searched for most often. We generate a try data structure based on the output of the Spark job. Once the try data structure has been created, we parse through it and then store the data in a Cassandra database. Whenever a user is online and they're searching for a certain string, we hit our API and with that suggestions endpoint and the query string. The endpoint talks to Cassandra and very easily gets a list of suggestions sorted by frequency and we return it to the client to be rendered. All right, so hopefully that gives you a quick and short idea about how uh, auto suggestion feature usually works. Of course, you can design it to be more scalable. You can also make it as so that the try data structure is being updated in more real time. But in this video, I'm gonna keep the scope small and talk about like the more offline use case. So hopefully that was helpful. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below and I'm gonna get back to you as soon as I can. With that being said, I hope you folks have a good rest of the day and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye-bye.